answer some people. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Elvira Liverdieva. I'm a product and offering specialist at Geosphere. And I'm speaking to you today from our headquarters in Saclay, France. And I'm very honored to see so many of you joining us from uh, different parts of the globe. So um, for today's uh, webinar, uh, we are going to walk you through the um, dual LiDAR, uh, dual scanning LiDAR solution and uh, how it's uh, getting um, acceptance for offshore wind resource assessment and uh, other types of campaigns. I will start this uh, discussion by um, providing an overview of the dual scanning LiDAR offering and the technology, uh, as well as the benefits uh, realized um, by the dual LiDAR, both um, uh, in terms of uh, data quantity and quality. Uh, then my uh, colleague, uh, Jérôme Soutamakozan, uh, will uh, take us through the operational requirements of the dual LiDAR, how to plan for the installation and the setup, and uh, how to configure the, the data between two scanning LiDARs. Uh, then Florian Jäger from uh, Fraunhofer IAE uh, will uh, provide details on Fraunhofer's first-hand experience uh, leveraging dual scanning LiDAR. And then uh, Matthias Steger with uh, DNV will uh, talk about the um, main uncertainty contributors uh, of the dual scanning later. Uh, so today's uh, speakers, um, uh, myself, uh, I'm um, I'm with Leosphere over um, a year now, uh, and I'm actively involved in uh, our onshore and offshore product marketing activities as a part of the product marketing team. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Jérôme Soutamakozan, is a service technical uh, project, um, sorry, <laughs> um, project manager for Leosphere. He has over nine years of experience uh, in the LiDAR industry as a technical expert uh, and a custom service specialist. Uh, he has an extensive background uh, delivering customer projects um, that leverage WinCube scan LiDARs. Then uh, Florian Jaeger uh, is, um, is working as a research uh, associate at the Fraunhofer Institute uh, for Energy Economics and Energy System Technology, where his uh, research focus concerns uh, scanning LiDAR measurements and uncertainties uh, in wind resource and uh, site assessment. Uh, he's also currently leading the project Milia, which investigates uh, multi-LiDAR measurements for resource assessment. And finally, Matthias Steger is a senior test engineer for DNV with um, 20 years of uh, wind energy experience. He is involved in the planning, installation, and evaluation of uh, mechanical loads and uh, power performance tests, mainly on wind turbine prototypes, and has a strong background in data analysis and uncertainty calculation. Uh, he was also involved in a measurement campaign looking at the quantification of the global blockage effect uh, on a German offshore wind farm. And this campaign uh, was based on the dual scanning LiDAR setup. And just uh, before we start a few housekeeping tips, um, once we finish the, the presentations, we will have a 10-minute uh, Q&A session. Uh, you can post your question by clicking on the uh, button at the, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we will try to answer as many questions as, po as possible during the webinar. And um, if we don't get uh, to all of the questions, uh, we will send more information after the webinar or directly contact you. Um, we also have... Um, uh, several resources uh, that you can access uh, by clicking on um, um, this uh, green button at the at the bottom of your screen to get some additional information. And uh, if you have any technical issues, you can click on the help icon to access the main um, um, questions and answers to the um, to the technical issues. And uh, well, this webinar is uh, recorded as always, uh, and we will be sending you an email with the link uh, in a few days uh, after the webinar. So uh, um, let's start. Uh, I, um, I will be kicking off this um, uh, discussion 
uh, first by uh, looking at the main uh, trends and challenges that we see today in the near shore markets. I will talk about the concept of the dual scanning LiDAR, its main benefits, as well as the um, uh, future applications that we see today uh, with, uh, with a dual scanning uh, setup. So, uh, first of all, um, as you know, uh, offshore wind is uh, booming across uh, different parts of the globe, both in uh, uh, far from shore uh, locations, but also near shore. So, for example, here you have um, uh, some examples of the near shore wind development, uh, and these are uh, especially projects uh, located within uh, 10 to 15 kilometers from the shore. And uh, for example, in the Asia Pacific, uh, those are the areas that, um, um, uh, such areas as uh, Japan or, um, sorry, my slides are going a bit crazy. All right, yeah, it's back. Okay, so in the Asia Pacific, um, it's uh, Japan or some projects in China, Taiwan, uh, as well as uh, in Europe, uh, North America. Uh, South uh, America as well. And um, just for you to understand what the nearshore project looks like, uh, this is an example from Japan. So you can see that the wind turbines are actually pretty close uh, to the shore. And uh, of course, with uh, with this kind of uh, nearshore wind development, there are certain uh, challenges that are uh, coming um, in these kind of scenarios uh, because of the um, certain sensitive natural environments. Uh, these kind of areas can be um, crowded because they serve different uh, industries such as fishery and uh, shipping. And also um, there are sometimes uh, uh, hard to assess uh, wind phenomena. So. Uh, um, so we are looking for a, a good solution to to still perform uh, accurate wind resource assessment. And basically, this is where we we saw the added value of the dual lidar setup, which is a combination of uh, two uh, wind cube scan uh, lidars. Um, but um, of course, we don't want to just uh, deliver the lidars. We also want to support. Uh, our clients through different stages of the of their projects. So in the pre-campaign part, uh, we provide scientific and technical support uh, to better prepare the measurement campaign. During the campaign itself, uh, there is certain training for the installation and the configuration of the lighter. Um, and uh, in the post-campaign part, uh, our scientific team uh, provide support on the data processing and the analysis. And uh, well, a bit a bit more about uh, the this um, uh, dual scanning LiDAR and what is uh, behind it is basically this um, uh, intersecting uh, uh, laser beam uh, strategy. And we continue to rely on the pulse LiDAR technology as it's known and valid validated for um, to, to, to provide uh, accurate uh, radial wind speeds. And basically, um, thanks to this uh, intersection of the laser beams, we can uh, uh, calculate the wind speed and direction from the radial wind speed measurements. And uh, this kind of um, um, setup is uh, pretty close to the point measurements uh, uh, done with the traditional uh, cup anemometers. And um, basically, um, because of this um, uh, intersecting laser beam, um, we can cover uh, large areas to, uh, to reduce uh, vertical and horizontal uncertainties, uh, thanks to this uh, ability to, to measure at uh, different locations and uh, heights at uh, different sampling rates which uh, kind of uh, imitates this um, MET-MAST measurements. And we can also calculate the turbulence intensity at uh, uh, one or two locations and heights, uh, which also provides a better understanding of the, of the site. 
And if we are to identify um, uh, the main benefits of this kind of approach is, uh, is that the, this intersecting strategy is uh, providing more detailed and accurate information uh, um, and uh, measurements of the, of the site uh, resources, which uh, results in reduced uncertainty in wind resource assessment campaigns. And uh, since the, uh, this kind of setup often happens on the, on the shore, um, it's, it's more cost effective, it's easier to access the LiDAR and maintain it, but also to repurpose it for other projects after this campaign is done. And uh, well, today we, uh, we focus uh, more on the offshore from the shore wind resource assessment. But there are also other applications uh, that uh, that are emerging um, in uh, other terrains. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if you need to do onshore assessment of uh, large sites in complex terrain, or uh, perform um, mm, sorry about this, or perform uh, power performance testing of multiple turbines. Uh, as also in uh, complex uh, terrain conditions, uh, and um, also different uh, R&D applications for, for example, for wake studies uh, or other kind of um, uh, studies for specific terrain features. So um, this is going to be the end of my presentation. I will now turn it over to Jerome, who will be talking about the operational considerations of the dual scanning LiDAR setup. Okay. Thank you, Elvira. Uh, so normally, you should see my slide. Um, I'm going to focus on the um, uh, operational recommendations. Um, the um, objective is to give you uh, an overview of, um, uh, of a key point uh, when you are using scanning LiDAR to, for dual LiDAR applications. Um, so as, um, as Elvira mentioned, um, uh, the dual LiDAR a typical setup is uh, obviously uh, having two wind cube scan, um, typically installed um, along the shore, uh, pointing above the sea. Um, and then using the radial wind data from the sensors uh, preprocess the, the, this data and reconstruct the, the horizontal wind vector. And uh, this can be done for, for several points. Um, uh, you can select different locations that you would call virtual mast, and, and you can select different height uh, for each uh, mast. Um, typically, we would use uh, a fixed uh, line of sight. Um, uh, in sync, uh, and then measure uh, each point uh, one after the other. Um, the, um, of course, the virtual mast or the locations where you want to measure has to be within the, the range of the, of the LiDAR. Um, and we would recommend um, at least just for the for data, data quality to have at least a 30 degree uh, relative angle between the the line of sight of each LiDAR and, um, and a maximum 10 degree elevation angle. Uh, yeah, that's a recommendation. You can go below or above both values, but you will probably uh, affect a bit the, the performances of, of your measurement. Um, yeah, so of course, the more points you have, uh, the longer will be the, the total sweep uh, duration. Um, we made some tests at Leosphere, and um, this is uh, the measurement, uh, the measurement that we got. Um, so when you, for example, for one virtual mast and two high, two wind, two wind cups, the total scan duration will be uh, four to six seconds. And then if you increase uh, the numbers of masts or cups, uh, let's say up to four masts, five cups, uh, then you will need uh, 56 to 62 seconds to scan uh, over all the points. Uh, this is just to give you a rough idea of, uh, of the timing. Um, 
the next slide is um, uh, installation requirements. Um, or just laid out one of the um, key uh, aspect is pointing accuracy. Uh, you want the beam to point uh, at the same location and uh, at the location you want, of course. Uh, especially because um, sometimes you may measure up to 10 kilometers and maybe more. Uh, and at that distance, uh, a small offset in the beam will create a, a big difference at, 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 at far distance from the LiDAR. So the first thing to, to yeah, the first thing to check is to make sure that we have a, a good, uh, a good um, set installation. Uh, Especially, yes, so one minute cube scan, uh, a rigid platform so that the scanner head doesn't, the scanning LiDAR doesn't move uh, over time. Uh, typically, you will have a, an external cabinet where you would install uh, your communication, your local server, uh, all you need to monitor the, the system. Um, and then uh, when you install the system, make sure that you have a good uh, horizontal leveling. Uh, so this is. Um, what we, we, uh, we try to sh I would try to show with these two pictures. Um, so you want something flat. Uh, this is picture four and five. You don't want something that vibrate uh, over over time. Uh, just to because the idea is to yeah minimize the as much as possible the uncertainties uh, of the measurement. Um, next slide is. Um, uh, the interface, uh, how, how do you operate the, the LiDAR and monitor the system? Um, and this is what we would recommend typically for, for dual LiDAR. So this is true for both systems. Uh, the first way is to use uh, the GUI, which is provided by the LiDAR, and this is controlled by a human. Um, you will be able to operate the system, configure the LiDAR, and do your manual monitoring and data download. Um, but yeah, what we really need for, for on the long-term basis, uh, it's uh, starting to use um, the API, which is uh, also one of the features of the scanning LiDAR. And with this one, uh, you can create your own interface, um, develop your automatic script. Uh, the idea is with the API, and this is something you will need, is to do some uh, remote monitoring, but on an automatically uh, basis and regular basis, uh, make any script and reboot the system when, when needed. I uh, will come back to this uh, at the end. Um, and with the API, you, you can also uh, download the, the data uh, with a customized schedule. For example, um, download uh, one day of data, which, which will take typically uh, one hour. Um, next slide is a recommendation about the pointing accuracy. Uh, so this is once you have your WinCube scan installed on site, uh, and uh, these are some uh, things to do uh, after the installation, so just to optimize the, the pointing. Um, so this is what we call the, the on-site uh, hard target calibration. So your LiDAR is already installed. Um, even if you have levered uh, the system uh, perfectly and you have uh, a very good installation, um, there will always be some um, some intrinsic uh, beam uh, misalignment, uh, which are due because the installation is not, it's not always perfect, can't be perfect. Uh, so you have some misalignment from the horizontal leveling and north orientation. And you also have a misalignment from the optics inside the system, uh, Talking about technology, everything has a tolerance, a mechanical tolerance, so you can't really perfectly uh, align all the optics together. So these two points will create uh, this misalignment, and this is something that we can uh, measure on site. Um, and we can also uh, compensate uh, this uh, misalignment uh, can be done uh, for some of the parameters uh, with the software, and uh, also uh, you can also uh, fine tune the, the LiDAR level. And uh, once you know the, the misalignment, you can compensate it by adjusting the level of the LiDAR 
uh, and setting the value at the opposite way of the, of the error. Um, and this is uh, here uh, pictures uh, um, of what we would do usually. So the LiDAR is installed and then we would identify at least three hard targets on site uh, so that we can measure the misalignment in different directions. Uh, and then we have a tool in the LiDAR which, which is called uh, hard target uh, mapping. And um, with this one, you can scan the target and you can uh, measure the elevation angles and azimuth angles uh, as it is uh, seen by the, by the LiDAR. Uh, and when you measure this uh, and, uh, and you know the theoretical value uh, using a reference tool like Theodolite and GPS coordinates, uh, you will see uh, this kind of error uh, sorry, it's a bit small, but it's um, it's showing you um, uh, a sinusoid uh, uh, and uh, along the azimuth direction. Uh, that means the, we have a misalignment uh, which is not constant in all directions. It varies, uh, and it varies in a sinus sinusoidal way. Um, so you can. Depending on the scan you use, if you use fixed scan, you, you could use this error as it is without any additional compensation. I mean, you just compensate in the software uh, the, the errors when you're configuring your scan. Or you can also try to flatten this sinusoid, and this is done by adjusting the LiDAR level. And uh, just by changing the pitch and roll of the LiDAR, you're able to flatten the, the sinusoid and get something like what we are seeing here. Uh, a flat sinusoid, uh, almost constant in all direction. And, uh, and then you have just a constant offset that you can put in the, in the system. Uh, so this second step, uh, it's, I would say, uh, optional. It really depends on the type of scan you are using, uh, because this additional step uh, add uh, another, I would say, two, two hours to your to your installation process. All right. Um, then the other slide, um, it's uh, about the synchronization between the two LiDARs. Um, yes, you want the, the LiDARs to point at the same location at the same time. Uh, you don't want delay between the, the LiDARs, but would also add uncertainties uh, in, the, in, the date, in the measurement. Uh, yeah, so if you don't do any optimization, uh, the desynchronization will increase between the two LiDAR, it will increase over time. Uh, the curve that you see on the left, it's just like, it's, it's two in cube LiDAR installed on site without any optimization, and you just start the two LiDARs at the same time, and the delay is just increasing immediately. Uh, and this is, uh, caused when you have several locations. So the travel time from one location to the other location will add uh, the synchronization, the synchronization between the LiDARs because uh, depending on where they are installed, they, they, don't travel, they don't have the same travel path between the locations. Uh, you have technical intrinsic differences between LiDARs. Uh, typically, the scan ahead doesn't move at the same speed for all devices. Uh, the computer is not running at the same speed, and this is due to the technology limitations. And then you have an expected event. You can have one LiDAR that restart uh, for some reason, and the other one continue to measure, and then you will immediately have uh, this kind of uh, synchronization effect. Um, so to avoid this, uh, this uh, desynchronization, um, yeah, these here are a few points. Uh, just uh, give you an idea how to compensate it. First thing, you, the travel time between the locations uh, can be compensated in the in the scan configuration. Um, and then uh, during our test, uh, what we did is um, we used uh, the scheduler, which is a, a feature of a WinCube scan, and you can start every scan at a at a specific time. This will also help you to uh, to, uh, to to keep the system in sync. 
Um, with, and with this kind of configuration, uh, what we were able to achieve is, uh, so our target is to not, to not have a delay higher than one second. So our target is one second. Uh, and what we got is most of the point was below 500 millisecond delay uh, with an average of uh, 60 millisecond. Um, yeah, and one, the last point is a uh, reference that you use for your LiDAR time uh, has to be uh, by NTP and uh, has to be the same for, for all LiDARs. Um, okay. And the last, uh, yeah, the last point is, um, uh, yeah, this is what I mentioned earlier. When you are doing dual, dual LiDAR, you, you will need to restart the system uh, on a daily basis, uh, once per day. Uh, and this is uh, very important to, so that you can reset, reset the, the computer latencies uh, that, that increase naturally over time, and you want to keep it uh, as low as possible. Uh, and it's not, it's actually, uh, can actually be integrated quite well with a uh, uh, lens mode, and uh, you can keep all of these so-called uh, maintenance tasks in the same 10-minute slot. So that uh, in a day you don't lose more than one uh, 10 minutes data. Okay, that's uh, just a couple of uh, of uh, point to uh, to check when doing this. Um, and this is the last slide. Um, so GLIDAR is quite, uh, I would say, quite complex. Uh, uh, it's not something that you. It's not. not, not always intuitive. Not something easy uh, to approach when you are a new, new uh, customer in a, in the with the WinCube lidar. So, uh, so yeah. The, the message here is uh, we are here to support your project, and uh, we we can provide specific remote support. Uh, we can also perform remote monitoring service. Uh, we can provide advanced LiDAR and calibration training, so explaining in details what I just mentioned in, uh, in five minutes. Um, and also, if you like to, uh, we can also send our field engineers who are qualified to install a, a WinCube for these kind of uh, applications. Okay, so I think that was the last slide for me, and uh, I will hand over uh, to Pranova. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jerome. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about our experience using dual or multi-LIDAR um, at Fraunhofer IWE. So as you can see, we have three LIDAR systems. Uh, sometimes we use it all together. Sometimes it's just two of them. Um, yeah, but let me start with giving some motivation for us to work with it and also maybe some kind of open challenges. So I think for us, it's, it's really great to have this high flexibility and the long ranges. So we can, as we, we saw before, simultaneously measure different locations. We don't have to use any CFD simulations for horizontal extrapolations. Uh, yeah, we can run different scan strategies and uh, we think there's a really high potential, especially in complex terrain and also offshore, but also uh, for tur turbulence measurements. But I think there is still quite a lot of challenges. So first of, so of all, it's, it's a little bit more expensive than we know it from profiling lighters, maybe. Um, the uncertainties is still a little bit difficult to, to quantify them. And without quantification of uncertainties, uh, it's hard to classify or calibrate um, the devices. And so maybe at the moment, it's it's some kind of maybe complex expert device. But I think we are really getting into the right direction. And today, I will focus a little bit more on the, on the positive side. So uh, but yeah, we have quite a lot of research activities uh, at our institute. Um, dealing with scanning lighters. So there are different projects about uncertainties and complex terrain and resource assessment. Uh, we're trying to, trying to investigate turbulence and other turbine design parameters. Uh, there's a project dealing with classification methods and uh, a recently started project uh, will also go offshore. Uh, I will talk about this a little bit later, but there's also the one which is not related to wind energy. So uh, there's a project which is interested in uh, the loads on a heliostat. Uh, so we are trying to measure the wind above a heliostat of a solar thermal power plant. And we also have our own uh, LiDAR control software. 
And so, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, research going on uh, at Fraunhofer IWE. So, uh, but let me start to show maybe some some practical examples. Uh, so in the past, we were very much uh, focused on complex terrain. And here you can see an example. So it's, it was quite complex terrain. And the, the blue line that you can see, that was a profiling LIDAR without some um, CFD correction. And as you can see, we have quite a um, big error depending on the wind direction, which is a typical behavior in complex terrain for profiling LIDARs. But if you have a look at the red line, this, is, this was a triple LIDAR system, and the green line, that was a dual LIDAR system, uh, we can get rid of this complex terrain error without using any CFD simulations or whatever. So uh, we can really prove that there's no systematic error due to complex terrain. And we can also see like in these kinds of scatter plots. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see a scatter plot from a profiling LIDAR uh, without CFD correction and the mat mask. And we see that there's quite a high scattering. And also the fit doesn't really look like it like it really should. So, um, but if we look at the right hand side, that was a dual lighter system. So the the scattering and the fit looks almost perfect. Of course, it's not always the case like this, but that was the, a good measurement. And I think we can really significantly reduce um, um, un uncertainties, especially in complex terrain using scanning lighters or dual lighters. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, what about turbulence? Turbulence is maybe a little bit more difficult. Uh, so here on the, the right-hand side, you can see like a typical scatter plot. And as you can see, we usually have a lower standard deviation in dual LiDAR measurements. Um, and I think the reason is mainly the probe volume averaging. So we are averaging data along the beam, and um, this leads to attenuation of turbulence measurements. Um, the magnitude of this attenuation depends on many parameters, for example, the wind direction and, and scanning angles. Uh, and as a result, we can see that we have an underestimation of, for example, the representative turbulence intensity, which is quite an important parameter for um, turbulence design, uh, sorry, turbine design. Um, but there's also good side. So uh, we, were, we were able to um, estimate um, this, this attenuation using a spectral tensor model, which is based on the MAN model of 94. And yeah, we can really model it and also use it to correct it. Uh, there was a recent uh, publication on this on the Wind Energy Science Conference, and we will ha also have a paper on this um, in the future. So yeah, there, there will be uh, they still work in progress, but yeah, you will get more information soon, I would say. Um, but there's there's also a second part with turbulence uh, measurements with multiliters. So if we measure at different locations, what we quite often do with um, dual lighter systems or multiliter systems, um, then we don't measure every second at every point. Uh, we get different sampling intervals. So for example, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see it in this little table. If we have 10 measurement points, for example, this roughly means that we measure every 20 seconds at this point, and we have only a sample rate of 30 samples in a regular 10-minute interval. Uh, and these low sampling rates, they increase the random error in turbulence measurements. And um, the, on, on this leads to an overestimation of representative um, turbulence intensity. So both effects, the, the effect from the slide before and this one, they have opposite signs. So if you're not lucky, um, so don't trust, uh, don't believe on this that you are lucky, but if you're lucky, then both effects might cancel out. So in our experiments, um, that was round about for 20 or 30 seconds um, return time to, to the point uh, that we could see this canceling out. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't really rely on this, uh, I would say. But the, the good thing, again, here, we can use the same spectral tensor model um, to estimate and also to correct um, these turbulence errors. And at the end, I think we, we will be able um, to give a very good idea of, of um, the errors in, in turbulence measurements, um, putting all effects together. Um, yeah, 
but now let me talk about something else. So as I said, we, we will also go offshore with our scanning lighters. And I think this is a little bit different, um, the, the, these kind of applications. So we don't um, use fixed line of sight um, measurements now any longer. So we use so-called PPI scans. These are some kind of area scans and we try to overlap um, the scans from different scanners. Um, and we, we are hoping uh, that we can optimize, for example, performance monitoring of large offshore wind farms. And because I, we think that's a, a really important topic for the future. And we, want, we don't only uh, want to have uh, the data from the scanning lighters, but we will also combine it with other data along the wind farm and combine it with neural networks and AI methods. Uh, and we think that that can be a really promising approach um, yeah, to, to uh, really um, make performance monitoring even better. And uh, yeah, there will be um, test campaigns and we will um, develop methods. And yeah, I think that that will be a, a pretty interesting um, uh, project. And I think there, there will many other applications be possibly coming out of it, can be for resource assessment, wake detection and so on. So, uh, yeah, as, as I said at the beginning, um, especially for offshore, I think there's a high potential for dual lighter measurements. Um, and for performing these kind of, of, um, of scans and, and measurements, uh, we decided um, to develop our own control software. And uh, Jerome um, um, mentioned before that there's this Leosphere a API that we also use. So we programmed our own graphical interface uh, for easy scanner programming. So for example, we can create scans by just um, giving uh, coordinates of the devices and the measurement locations as an input. Uh, we can also implement pitch and roll and yaw of, of the devices. And um, I think that can be a pretty easy way um, to get rid of this complex expert device um, thing that I mentioned at the beginning. And we also have this um, automated synchronization um, implied and um, the hard target test we can also run with our software to get these little pictures that you can see in the bottom right corner. Uh, but we're still developing it a little bit further. So um, for example, we would like to have some visualization of live data um, to detect maybe possible errors uh, as soon as possible. But also, and I think that's a pretty interesting thing, especially for the offshore campaign that we are um, um, running in the future, uh, is that we have um, some kind of automated adjustment of measurement locations. So if you're, for example, always are interested in the wind conditions in front of a wind turbine, depending on the wind direction. So we'd, we'd like to, to implement a method that we can choose the measurement point, for example, by more or less real-time wind direction. So uh, yeah, I think that that can be a really helpful tool. Um, yeah, and so let me quickly wrap up um, before I hand over to Matthias. Um, so I think we could see that we have, especially in, in complex terrain, a high accuracy with dual lighters or multi-lighters in general. But maybe also one word of warning, uh, Matthias will talk about it a little bit more in detail. Um, so you should definitely try to avoid bad scanning angles if you have, just have two um, devices. So the errors can be really, really high. So sometimes it might be beneficial to install a third scanner, depending on what, what you're trying to measure. Uh, then we saw that the turbulence attenuation uh, due to probe volume averaging and also the increase um, of random error, we can model them and we can correct them. Um, and yeah, as I said, there will be a publication on this in the future. Um, we think there's this high potential, especially for offshore applications and how we can prove this with our future project or the recently started project. And I think these kinds of control softwares um, that we are developing and maybe we are not the only ones, they can really help to reduce the complexity, uh, especially for unexperienced users to uh, get rid of this um, complex expert tools. And uh, also these kind of softwares may allow us to really use customized scans for many different applications and really use this flexibility um, that we have with, with these devices. 
And but yeah, there's still quite a lot of work in progress. Um, as I said, the quantification is is one part of of what we are analyzing at the moment, and we hope that this might lead um, to full classification and calibration methods. And I think this is um, maybe one of the most important things to make it really um, usable in commercial applications. And um, yeah, we are really looking forward into the future with um, scanning or dual LiDAR um, devices because we think it's, yeah, it's, it's really great tool for, for many different applications. Um, yeah, so that was it from my side. Um, I will now hand over to Matthias Steger and yeah, it's your turn. Thanks, Florian. And thanks everyone else for, for joining. Uh, the topic of uh, my little presentation today is uh, the main uncertainty contributors. And uh, as the agenda, probably a bit of a spoiler, it's about the uh, beam intersection angle on one hand and the uncertainty of the elevation angle. We touched that briefly on the other hand and how they uh, influence the overall uncertainty of the measurement. Um, we in uh, DNV are approached more and more often, especially last weeks or months, uh, from clients um, asking us, we are planning a dual LIDAR campaign, please tell us the uncertainties. And the good thing is that we can answer that pretty quickly. The bad thing is that the answer mostly is, well, it depends. And um, we have on the right side uh, the uh, like this little equation how to calculate uh, or how to do the, the, the wind field reconstruction. And one way of uh, estimating uncertainties is, is uh, calculating partial derivatives uh, of all the components with their associate, um, associated uncertainties to, to get the overall uncertainties and that doesn't make the job not not easier and and also results in a pretty non-linear system at the end where all of the contributors uh, have an influence on on the overall uncertainty um, I would like to refer to that paper of Nikola Vasilyevich which I have based a lot of the following um, figures on and let's jump right into the topic of the intersection angle. Here on the left we have uh, a setup uh, of, of two lighters. Um, the left example shows an, an intersection angle of 10 degrees, the, the, the other example is uh, showing 30 degree intersection angle and as a pretty much worst case scenario, we have the wind coming from the side, resulting in line of sight wind speeds. So, so actually the, measure, the measured values of the LIDARs in the first example of only 0.9 meter per second, and for the second example, at least 2.6 meters per second. So these comparably low values make the complete system very sensitive to the measurement uncertainties of the line of sight wind speeds. And on the, on the top, uh, the, 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 the background gives you the sensitivity factor for, for the line of sight uncertainties and, and there also you can find like this, this intersection angle. To make that a little bit more uh, so, so that you can, can, can grab that a little better. I have chosen some, some random test site. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's just roughly 10 kilometers from where I sit. Uh, actually, the, the mouth of, of the Elbe River here in Germany. Uh, I don't think there, there will ever be a, a wind farm, but uh, I've, I've indicated uh, with, the left, with, the, with the yellow circle uh, a potential wind farm where I would like to have some, some wind resource assessment. Um, then the uh, green and blue triangles 
are some locations of, of LIDARs I have identified. Um, the, the little arc gives you a, a, as a reference a 10 kilometer distance and uh, the, uh, the color map gives you a calculated uncertainty for each of these indiv individual points. So if I would measure at this point, my uncertainty would be that. And if I would measure on that point, my uncertainty would be that. Uh, legend on, on, on these pictures, I don't know if you can see that, ranges from 0% green to 10% red. And as you can see in the, in the upper left picture, um, the area of interest, we have uncertainties way above the acceptable. Even if, if I have used, uh, like we talked about elevation angle and, and all that pretty, pretty common values for, for these uncertainties, but still um, like 10% uncertainty in your wind speed, I think it's, it's not very satisfactory. On the other hand, the picture below, you have some, some, some green areas um, for the case the wind is coming along the laser beam. So when the wind is coming from a direction where I, I, I measure, where I place my LIDAR, uh, my, my uh, laser beams, then it seems even with this setup, I can achieve pretty good uncertainties. But this setup seems to be or is highly dependent on, on wind direction. Coming to the next slide, uh, color is changing and all the input parameters for all the uncertainty values I've used are completely the same. The only thing changing is the position of the lighters. The opening or the, the beam intersection angle now seems to be or is uh, around, let's say, 60 degree. And it's not only that the overall uncertainties are much better in this case, we also got rid of all the wind direction dependencies. So that's why that, that is the reason why this uh, beam intersection angle should be uh, bigger than, than 30 degree as, as Jerome mentioned. The second, uh, topic I would like to touch is the elevation angle. It's um, obvious that if there is a change in the elevation angle, that uh, pretty much translates in, in a difference in, in measurement height. And as we are talking about long range scanning lighters, uh, this effect gets, gets bigger with, with uh, longer ranges. And with your site-specific wind profile, this difference in height, of course, ends up in, in a bias in the wind speed measurements. So in this example below, I've, I've just taken a an, an measurement range of eight kilometers. And if I change the elevation angle just by 0.1 of a degree, uh, that already changes the, the measurement height by 14 meters. And uh, with uh, even with this low wind shear exponent, it ends up with approximately 1.5% wind speed uh, difference. And that's why also depending on, on a lot of factors, but the uncertainty caused by this elevation uncertainty is usually uh, the biggest part. Here we have the same example as before. We already learned we need to place the lighters allowing a good intersection angle. So we did that, but still on the, on the very left, we have some uncertainties in the range of probably five or 6%. Um, and the value I changed is the uncertainty of the elevation angle, starting from point four on the left, which pretty much describes the scenario. I just take the device out of the box, put it there with the uh, with the uh, 
um, inclination sensors of the device, level it and start measuring, calculate my, my geometry and configure the elevation angles and, and just don't do any hard target testing at all. And on the other hand, uh, going further to the to the right, we have uh, uh, at the end point one degree uncertainty in the elevation angle. And that picture shows us that it's really worth spending that effort and increase the accuracy of the overall measurements. So what can we um, um, evaluate with, with the hard target testing? I would will go quickly through that. As Jerome already said, we have, I call it a static offset. So that gives you the average difference between the elevation angle configured in the device compared to the real uh, elevation angle um, of the laser. Then we have the that azimuth dependent offset, which is mainly caused by, by a tilt of the rotational axis. Uh, we have pretty good experience um, as we are talking about offshore using sea surface uh, for these relative changes, probably not for absolute offset determination, but for, for relative. So this sinus shape curve uh, we we uh, found that as well. And we also found in this example at the bottom that it makes a difference uh, if we if you do uh, RHI scans, it makes a difference if you do it upwards or downwards. And we explained that to ourselves as a kind of hysteresis effect. Uh, of course, it also makes sense to repeat these tests to make sure you have a long-term stability. We touched that topic as well. And uh, one thing I would like to mention, uh, probably not, not to the topic of hard target testing, but when exceeding the 10K range, it probably also makes sense starting, start thinking about uh, earth curvature as well. So wrapping, wrapping things up, uh, it's important to choose the position so your opening angle exceeds the mentioned 30 degree. Uh, it makes sense to put some effort in reducing the uncertainty of the elevation angle by on-site hard target test. Uh, the long-term stability we mentioned and also put some effort in a detailed campaign planning and do the uncertainty evaluation uh, uh, site or project specific. Uh, we would be happy to support uh, such efforts. And uh, if you keep all, all these uh, measures in mind, the dual LIDAR approach is definitely a good way to get some accurate wind speed measurements, even in far distances. That was my part and I guess I give back to um, to the Q&A session. Yes. Uh, so, well, many thanks uh, to all of our speakers today, with a special thanks to Fraunhofer and DNV for participating. So, uh, well, let's dive into some of the questions here. And... Um, I think this one is going to be for you, Matthias. Um, does the intersection angle uncertainties vary with the height as well as wind direction? Uh, you th should unmute yourself, Matthias. There it is. So uh, I can find, can you repeat that question again? Sure, yes. So the, um, there is a question, does the intersection angle uncertainties vary with height as well as wind direction? Yes, so I wouldn't call it inter like intersection angle uncertainties. 
but the overall uncertainties are definitely influenced by the intersection angle as well as all the other effects like wind direction and height and and uh, even wind shear and things like that. That's 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 why I, I put so much uh, emphasis on do that uncertainty evaluation for your setup and uh, or it makes sense to do that for your setup to avoid surprises in the measurement at the end. Yeah. If that answers the question. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And there is a question. This one is for Florian. I think it's a specific to your slide 30. Um, there is a question on how many virtual cups were used in this project and what was the configuration of the wind cube? Maybe we can go um, back to this slide. I'm not sure. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So I think that was the slide. Um, so we had one mass as a reference and we just compared it to the top cup. Um, so we had measurement data for every second really next to the cup anemometer. Um, so there were not more involved than this. Um, so uh, can you please repeat the question once again, uh, if, there were, if I'm still missing something to answer. Yeah, it was about the uh, number of virtual caps and the configuration of the LIDAR. I yeah, the configuration of the LIDAR. So, uh, I mean, the, the attenuation of turbulence uh, depends, of course, on the LIDAR settings. For example, um, the probe volume length that we choose. And I think in this situation, there was something like 75 meters, if I'm cor um, remembered correctly. Uh, but yeah, all these parameters we can also put into this um, spectral tensor model and really try um, to estimate this error depending on your specific se settings. So, um, yeah, um, I hope this answers the questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, Florian. And we have a couple of uh, operational questions as well. I think this, those will go to Jerome. Um, so there is someone asking how much area would be required for a complete setup, including the power supply system and uh, the lighter, I guess. Um, well, for the for the lighter, we would the lighter itself, the footprint is for, uh, approximately one meter per one meter. Uh, but because we recommend to have a free space around the lighter so that you to ease the, the maintenance operation. Uh, so typically you will need something like three per two meters uh, for installing the LiDAR and all the accessories, including the electrical cabinet. Uh, I can see in the question there's also mentioned PV panels. Uh, I would say PV panels, probably you will need extra space, but for for the wind cube scan, um, the power consumption is uh, 1.6 uh, kilowatt. So usually, uh, but we'll make a lot of PV panels, so uh, we won't. We would not recommend that unless if you have a lot of space. Um, yeah. Well, I think we have uh, a couple of minutes to ask some uh, last-minute questions. Um, all right. Let me see. Well, there, there are some questions about uh, bankability and um, uh, people are interested to know if the dual scanning LiDAR measurements are currently accepted by the banks and investors. So um, maybe uh, either Florian or Matthias can uh, comment on that as well. Um, yeah, maybe I can start, and if Matthias wants to add something, um, feel free. Um, so, I, as I mentioned, I think the, the main problem at the moment is still the the real uncertainty quantification. Uh, so, uh, not not only to to quantify it, but also to make it um, like um, for others to follow this this kind of quantification. So, if we don't have uncertainties, we, we can't go to banks and say, uh, okay, we would like to have money for our campaigns. So I, I think that this is one of, of the most important things that we have to get rid of uh, in, the, in the next years, I would say. Um, so to have this 
that, that we can really rely on, on the measurement data and also on the uncertainties. So it's not only a rule of thumb or anything else so that we can really quantify them. And I think that would really help to classify and so on uh, the devices and that would make it helpful to, um, to make them bankable, I would say. From, if I could add something. So from my experience, we had a, a recent project with exactly that topic and I don't think that we are at the stage. I'm not a wind resource expert though, so if there's someone else who, who proves me wrong, that's okay. But uh, I don't think it's it's per se bankable at the moment, but uh, so the project we were involved in, we did exactly evaluate uh, this specific project and, and, and help to find a good, um, good set up and reduce the uncertainties and also give an estimate about expected uncertainty and and combine that also with the extrapolation uncertainties talked about how many points to measure and things like that for this specific project and i think something like this could be a way to maybe also to help banks to better handle the risk i mean at the end it's, it's a question of risk the bank is taking and if, if if we can show that this risk can be handled, uh, then I think it would be the way to go. And and I agree with Florian. This is exactly our job at the moment to to uh, better quantify uncertainties and, and increase uh, the trust in this uh, technology. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, well, it's time to wrap up. Uh, we actually ran a bit late. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you for our speakers. And if you want to be directly contacted, please let us know. Otherwise, we will also communicate the recording with you in a few days. So, uh, well, yeah, thank you very much. And um, have a nice day. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks,